So um, we're going to have a conversation and uh, pose some questions to George. And maybe he'll have some questions for us, and maybe you'll have some questions for George as well. Now, maybe I'll, I'll get it started with this question, George. Um, Denver Water has published a book through uh, author Patty Limerick, and I was paging through it, didn't read the whole thing yet, but I did notice where she refers to the powerful Colorado River District. <laughs> the, you know, not that we think that we're powerful. We don't walk around the halls saying, oh, we're powerful today. Um, we just hope that we're effective most of the time. But then I, uh, I read the back cover of our book, and basically you said, well, we, we, over 75 years, we, we've used imagination, political shrewdness, and legal facility, and appeals to moral rightness to do our work. That sounds like smoke and mirrors to me. So how do we go from smoke and mirrors to power? <laughs> well, uh, I don't uh, see the River District through the, those 75 years as having been powerful as 10% of the state's population, still is actually, we keep saying 20% and 80%, but it's really closer to 10%, maybe 12. And uh, uh, it is uh, faced with the problem of a minority and a democracy where majorities rule. And how does a minority uh, get its uh, fair share in a democracy where it's a, a very small minority. Uh, I think you have to rely on uh, being uh, smart, inventive, uh, occasionally obnoxious. They did that occasionally. They <laughs> uh, Going down and uh, uh, consulting with California on uh, how to uh, stall off uh, something they didn't want to see happen. Now that's a, uh, that's a brave thing for a Colorado entity to do, maybe even a foolish thing, but uh, it didn't result in uh, California taking advantage of us any more than uh, they ever have, and uh, it uh, actually worked. Uh, so I would say uh, clever, inventive, and uh, uh, always uh, knowing the law and being prepared to, uh, uh, <laughs> well, if you're 10% of the population, uh, you have to be prepared to probably give a lot to get a little, uh, especially if uh, the, the, the other side doesn't have to give you anything by the law. So. Not powerful, but uh, uh, intelligent, uh, uh, clever, and uh, inventive, and uh, occasionally uh, taking the offensive or just being offensive. We, 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 we do like it, though, if Denver Water thinks we're powerful. We'll take that one. <laughs> that sounds like a, a kind of compliment that people give you before they reach into your pocket for your wallet. But uh. <laughs> okay, well, well, thanks, George. I um, wanted to uh, say thank you for this great book. Um, I've been reading, reading the final, and I, of course, I had a chance to see some of the uh, chapters as they were being developed. And, and I just want to say for you and and, and Jim and, and Chris, uh, thank you for 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 such a, a great resource. Um, meanwhile, my life and, and Peter Fleming and many of the River District staff's lives for the last five years have, have been consumed by uh, nego uh, facilitated negotiations on, with, with both Denver Water and, and the municipal sub-district of Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. Uh, it seems to me it's very similar to, to some times in the past, only this time we had a much larger staff, actually, uh, than, than they had in, in, the, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, I just have a couple of questions for you and maybe some, ask for you to speculate on a couple of things, because I want to draw our experience, uh, their experience, uh, or our experience from the recent 30 years of negotiations with Denver and the more recent five years. Uh, and maybe hear what you think about those. The, the first, of course, is that 
Uh, we in seem to be intentionally set a double standard uh, in the 30s. Uh, one was when we were going to negotiate with the Colorado, with the founders of the Colorado Big Thompson Project, the Northern Colorado Water Users Association, that there was substantial mitigation necessary to bring the West Slope. And of course that resulted in Green Mountain, that resulted in a number of things. Uh, on the other hand, as far as Denver, um, as you point out, there was this, and I think it, you, you trace it to uh, maybe one letter from Congressman Taylor, that we saw Denver as the queen city of the plains and, and what was good for Denver uh, is good for the West Slope, and as long as they don't compete for compete with us on an agricultural basis, um, we're not going to ask of Denver what we asked of of the Northern Colorado water users. Uh, same as maybe true of, of of in the 50s of the of the Southeast. And, and I guess my question was, uh, go go back to the district folks in the 30s and said, why was what was their what was their thought? What led them to that? double standard and and do you think when did that double standard go away in the river district's history <laughs> actually i think by the time there was a river district that uh, had pretty much uh, gone away from the perspective of the people that created the river district and uh, became part of its first board and such like it was really strictly taylor's thing that, and he surprised people with it. That was at a meeting in uh, Denver where the East Slope and the West Slope people had come together. Uh, the headline in the paper was Colorado watermen meet to bury the hatchet. I think it was. Oh, no, to bury the hatchet in order to get federal dollars. That was they were burying the hatchet to get federal dollars, and uh, it was called by George Bull, who was the uh, uh, the Colorado director for the Public Works Administration, and he had also before that been uh, Denver Waters uh, uh, field engineer, but uh, which may explain why PWA gave a nice fat uh, grant to Denver Water when they were doing Moffat. But the fact is. By 1933, uh, Denver Water was already beginning work on the Moffat project. And so I think Taylor might have said, we're willing to let the Queen City uh, do this without giving us uh, compensatory storage because, uh, well, fact of the matter is they're already taking water without giving us compensatory storage. And if we say it's OK, then uh, uh, it's they're doing it with our permission rather than doing it ag against our futile efforts to uh, <laughs> get them to stop this project. I think that was pretty much the situation, and uh, it uh, he wasn't going to let anybody else get away with that. Uh, Congressman Taylor wasn't, but uh, I think that was uh, okay. you know, it was pretty much because it was already happening, and uh, Denver was not. Uh, made it pretty clear. Um, George, yesterday our board met and they were discussing our health insurance. Keeping that in mind, uh, in the book you point out, uh, you make a point to point out that we seem to have killed off three of our key people <laughs> over the years, our second general counsel, our second uh, secretary treasurer, and Judge Clifford Stone who was uh, um, one of our early founders and an uh, instrumental in the Co Colorado Water Conservation Board. What was going on in those years that made the work so so deadly? <laughs> well, they they were doing it uh, with a staff of basically two and a half. Well, they were doing it with a staff of one and a half, uh, pretty much. Uh, the secretary engineer was the only real full-time employee and they had an office assistant. That might have gone up to two people, the office assistant. From, what was her name? Uh, Eunice. Eunice, yeah, Eunice probably came on full-time full at some point. But they were doing with a staff of two. And what they got into when, uh, uh, after the Colorado River Storage Act passed, or actually through the 50s, when the Colorado Storage Act was still going through the mills of uh, Congress, 
it, it occurred to everybody in the state that the Colorado River dis or the Colorado uh, Water Colorado River Water Storage Project was probably going to utilize an awful lot of the Colorado River's, Colorado share of the Colorado River on the west slope and also for protection downriver. And uh, therefore, if anybody wanted to get any of that water off of the west slope, they'd better get it before people started filing for the uh, River Storage Act and the, river st the, the Colorado River District people realized they had to get out there before the Front Range got everything tied up, because they, they, they did, they sent a, a virtual army, no, a literal army, of, uh, of surveyors over to start uh, surveying projects for Trans Mountain Diversions all the way down into uh, the Lower East River in, in what was in '56 that uh, the uh, uh, Denver Water Board passed a resolution to file on everything down to the junction of uh, the Colorado and Eagle Rivers. Uh, three West Slope and, uh, people signed the transmittal letter of the agreement to the secretary, and it was A.C. Sudan, uh, Clifford Stone, and then I believe Silman Smith here from the Valley. Now, A.C. Sudan was, was Grand County's representative, but Grand County, uh, although it was participated in those discussions, didn't really come into the district until the 1950s. Uh, and I'm wondering what was the lesson there uh, and why, uh, despite what seemed to be a, pretty much a victory and something we say, oh, Senate Document 80 was this, uh, this great, uh, great compromise and allowed for, for development on both sides. Why did Grand County really not want to come into the River District for a number of years? Now, it's the legislator's decision. It's not up to a county as to whether or not they're in the district. It's, a, it's created, the, the boundaries are created by the, by the legislature, but obviously they have some influence over what they did in the, in the, in the 30s. Why? What was the story there? <laughs> well, uh, when you look at uh, water history anywhere, probably, there's uh, a big difference between the willingness of people to accept a water project, whether they're below the dam, or above the dam, or under the dam. And uh, Grand County felt that uh, they were the ones that were going to bear all the brunt of the Colorado Big Thompson. Uh, Grand Lake, uh, the, the new res the Granby Reservoir that was going to drown out all this uh, beautiful trout fishery. Uh, they uh, and they weren't going to. They weren't in a position where they were really going to get much benefit from the compensatory storage at Green Mountain down on the Blue River. And uh, they <laughs> brought this up at a meeting in Grand Junction in March of 1937 which was when uh, all of the uh, kind of discussions that had been going on were sort of brought home to the people of Western Colorado. They brought this up. And Frank Delaney, who was the attorney, uh, had a, uh, he, he but uh, some, somebody described Frank Delaney as having a tongue that could peel the hide off of a, a, a bull. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he got mad at uh, Grand County because he'd been trying to get help from an engineer up in Grand County who just didn't have the time to do it. And uh, so he got really mad at them. They got mad back and uh, basically uh, decided they were not going to participate in this. They would be better off negotiating with the Front Range on their own, the Front Range and the Bureau. Uh, not the Front Range, really, the, the South Platte people. I think, you know, one of the things that with uh, the Colorado Big Thompson, it was, a lot of it was uh, n not so much farmers negotiating with farmers as it was attorneys for farmers on one side, negotiating with attorneys for farmers on the other side, but it was still pretty much agricultural people talking to each other 
it was never that with Denver, and the relationship with Denver was uh, different and worse from the very get-go. Uh, is that? Uh, yeah, just with that, let me let me amplify. Maybe I have a suggestion. Um, you noted that uh, George M. Bull is a, is a major figure in this uh, in this process. You know, he was uh, the division or he was a staff engineer for Denver Water when they uh, when made their initial uh, plans and so sort of things for the Moffett system. Uh, he went on and took a major role in the with the with the federal government during the 30s. Uh, you know, he, like Clifford Stone, has nothing named after him. Uh, I'm just wondering maybe if Grand County and Denver should consider uh, renaming the Moffat Tunnel after Mr. Mr. Bull, <laughs> and then uh, Grand County could have some fun with that. <laughs> see, uh, <laughs> no, no bull here. Or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, the... Uh, one of the things that really uh, uh, interested me in, in going through this history was the number of people that really did an awful lot of really good, hard work, uh, especially on the West Slope. But, uh, you know, George Bull is, is, is probably another one. And, uh, but people on the West Slope that did a lot of really good work and have been completely forgotten by uh, well, everybody. Nobody knows about Clifford Stone, who was really one of the uh, people that made this whole system that was put together in 37 work. He was a native of Gunnison, Powderhorn actually, and uh, he uh, uh, just stepped in at a certain point and uh, got things organized, and then he's the, he was the chief negotiator for the uh, uh, Upper, Colora Upper Colorado Basin uh, Compact. Uh, a remarkable person for his ability to just sit down with people and get things worked out. The only place it never worked was in his home valley, the Gunnison Valley, the Upper Gunnison. Uh, it, uh, it, that, that was an interesting situation there, but that's another whole story. <laughs> when it comes to water, um, George, the Colorado Constitution and the Continental Divide, in respect to those two entities, the, col the divide actually divides nothing. The, the Constitution says water is water, and it's a flat state, and you can basically get it if you could put it to beneficial use, build a project. Nevertheless, uh, that, that caused the issues with Denver water. Um, we kept going to water court and losing, or winning at the local level and losing at the Supreme Court level. And the, there's this whole notion of uh, Colorado one, Colorado two, and Glenn Saunders didn't think we on the West Loop knew how to read, I guess, when it came to the Constitution. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, they said, do you have any questions you want to put to us? And I was going to put this one to uh, <laughs> Jim and Eric, but uh, Glenn Saunders said in his uh, retirement, uh, at, after his retirement, uh, uh, he wrote a kind of a memoir, which is really kind of fascinating. It's easy to find on the internet, but he said, uh, there were clearly two states, Colorado one, where the capital was located east of the Continental Divide, and Colorado two, west of the Continental Divide. The judges, the lawyers, the legislators, and all local officials in Colorado two, so far as water law was concerned, had their own law for Western Colorado and had never heard of the Colorado Constitution. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm going to just throw the question right back to you. Uh, it, 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 really what it comes down to is this issue of uh, uh, compensatory storage. There's nothing in the Constitution saying that if you take water out of one basin, which isn't even mentioned in the Constitution, taking it out of one basin into another, uh, it's simply the waters, you know, the right to divert will unappropriated waters from any stream will never be denied. Uh, 
the uh, uh, idea of compensatory storage is much more of a, a moral idea. If you're taking somebody's future or part of somebody's future away, do you owe them anything? And Taylor was a very, uh, Congressman Taylor was a very moral person. And uh, uh, Chips Berry uh, at a, one of the water conferences at Western uh, State Colorado University uh, said uh, in 2005 in a talk there that uh, the people of the West Slope have never had a legal beef about uh, Trans Mountain Diversion, but they may have a moral issue. And so uh, it's not in the Constitution. Uh, he's right about that. Saunders was right about that. But uh, you want your law to match your morals, I think, to some extent. And uh, is there a, a, a moral issue there that needed to be reflected in the law? To a certain extent, still does need to be reflected in the law, perhaps. But oh. Give that right back to you. I'll let Eric uh, opine a little bit more intelligently, but I do know, for, uh, having worked in newspapers and uh, previous to this career, that there are a lot of people on the West Slope, you know, want to say, no, not one more drop, not one more drop, and that's certainly what they wanted to say, or some wanted to say in the 1930s, but you don't have a leg to stand on when you say not one more drop, and I guess it's kind of amazing that um, there is any water left in western Colorado to some extent, <laughs> but you know, we, we, in the 30s we were able to get um, the compensatory storage um, piece of legislation, although it didn't pertain to Denver water. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm also um, you know, mindful of the fact that, the, that we're dealing with a public resource and I think the idea that the, I guess what they came up with, the Frank Delaney idea uh, that surfaced actually prior to uh, Senate Document 80 and, and it sort of became the model for Senate Document 80 and then the early Fryark project was that, that the West Slope did have an obligation to share its surplus water with the East Slope. That that, that, that was water that the state could develop under the compacts and if it was surplus to our needs, uh, we would support you politically uh, and morally on that issue. Uh, and then, of the course, the debate became what's needed on the West Slope. Uh, what, what are our needs? And when does that development of East Slope water not become surplus to our needs? It, it, when, when does it take away from our present and future needs? In those days, they were primarily dealing with need for uh, water for irrigation purposes. In fact, Senate Document 80 only looked at irrigable lands when it tried to determine needs. Uh, you know, today that's water quality, today that's recreation, today that's, that's water for municipal uses and, and, and power uses, so it's become much more complex and much easier to, uh, I mean, not much easier, much more difficult to determine what our needs are. But I think that was sort of the moral approach that people could buy into, and, and I think in some ways that was the genius of, of Frank Delaney, which was, yes, you can do it, but as long, if you meet our needs and we have surplus to our needs, uh, then, then let's work together. Yeah. You have another question for us? <laughs> okay. Uh... I uh, got the feeling, uh, and said it somewhere in the book, uh, something to the effect that Coloradans from both sides, from both slopes, may have historically used California as a convenient bogeyman, saying we've got to develop our Colorado River water now because if we don't, California will take it. This statement usually appeared when somebody was pushing a water project. Uh, but after the relatively recent quantification settlement whereby California agreed to reduce its use of the water to its original 4.4 million acre feet, and it's theoretically actually working on that, mm -hmm. uh, and the interim guidelines for equalizing the contents of the two big reservoirs, 
Is there any remaining accuracy or truth in portraying California or any of the other lower basin states as bogeymen out to take our water? Do you think the lower basin states are actually going to play by the rules and adhere to the compact? And what do you see as the appropriate relationship today between the upper basin states and the lower basin states? Great questions. Uh, probably the subject of an entire conference. <laughs> we did hear a little bit uh, about that this morning. Uh, I don't know if Chuck is still here and, and, and Jennifer or the folks that are still here. Um, but I, I will present you my view, and, and, and there are some differences there. And, and I think it was a very recent governor during a debate over a statewide, what was it, Proposition A or, or whatever it was, that said the same, same thing. If we didn't pass this proposition, that I think failed in every county in the state, uh, that California would take our water. Uh, it makes great 15 second sound bite. It, it, in reality, it, it, it doesn't really pass the smell test. California has a right to 4.4 million acre feet under Arizona v. California. California started using 4.4 million acre feet in 2003. And unless things really turn wet down the, ro you know, down the road, they're gonna continue to use that 4.4 million acre feet. So is California the boogeyman? No. Uh, do the upper basin and lower basin states or upper division and lower division states need to have a cautious uh, relationship and, and be concerned about what each other are doing? Yes. Uh, but I think Jennifer Pitt's um, one PowerPoint from this morning sort of shows how that has changed. Uh, we're no longer, we're talking right now about under certain conditions in the future, if we develop an extra 100,000 acre feet or 200,000 acre feet of water, some big project, at some point in the future, it's inevitable that the operation of that big project will take water away uh, from somebody that's currently using it today in the upper basin under a post-compact water right. So that's sort of the risk management issue, and, and I think we're kind of moving, transitioning from the lower basin as the boogeyman to, or Cal, especially California, to more sophisticated uh, look at how we manage this resource given the hydrologic uncertainties and how we do that within the upper basin. I, I think we're there. It's just when will the politics and the 15 second sound bites catch up with us? Amen. Green Mountain Reservoir plays a big role in our history and, and in your book. And um, you point out to great length um, that Denver Water just seemed hell bent on making that an empty hole and somehow we survived. Um, how about a little bit back, a little bit more background? Sorry about this, Mike. A little bit more background into what, what was Denver up to trying to take out Green Mountain Reservoir? Well, they were upstream with a fairly junior water right. Uh, what about ten years junior? Well, yeah, Green Mountain is 1935, and and, yeah. and Denver's 1946. Yeah. The, uh, a 10-year junior water right, and uh, they had not expected that. They, uh, it's true that almost every time uh, the West Slope went to the state Supreme Court, uh, we lost, but uh, we won a big one in uh, 54, uh, right, right, I think 54. Uh, on the Blue River, and uh, at that that was when uh, the State Supreme Court upheld the uh, district court's ruling that was the 1935 uh, and 46 uh, water decrees for uh, Green Mountain and Denver's plans. And De Denver was surprised and shocked by that. They tried to go back uh, two or three times uh, and the Supreme Court kept uh, refusing. Uh, it, it uh, infuriated Glenn Saunders, needless to say, uh, and he was a pretty furious guy anyway, uh, all the time, I think. <laughs> I mean, some of the things in uh, Patty's book, Patty Limerick's book about uh, Saunders are just 
this guy was actually uh, saying these things in a courtroom. But uh, uh, I, I really think that most of the, a lot of the trouble with Denver came through Saunders. I don't know if he uh, initiated it or if he was told to be a, a pit bull going after the West Slope or just that was his instinct. But uh, uh, the relationship with Denver was terrible as long as uh, Saunders was there. Uh, and uh, after Saunders left, things started to open up in 86. I, was that the year he left? Uh, well, he, no. he, yeah, we really he, he had he had gone he had gone to his own law firm. He was still right. doing uh, he was still retained by, yeah. and Jack Ross. But uh, in, uh, when when the start, uh, when he stepped back a little bit, uh, Eric and uh, the a couple of guys from uh, the Front Range started meeting kind of informally to just see if they're. Yeah. was some way that uh, you should tell that story. Well, it was Andy Williams <laughs> from, from down here. Yeah, uh, right. and, and, and I and, and, uh, and Raleigh, uh, when things got serious, uh, were meeting with the Front Range. And uh, it's funny, I, I learned from, from, George, uh, from George's book that uh, you know, we were talking about a way to take some of the pressure off of Denver by doing substitutions, allowing them to maximize their Dillon Reservoir. Uh, which, by the way, you know, Dillon Reservoir is about 200,000, well, it's a little under 200,000 acre feet today. Its capacity is 250,000 for those in, the, in, in uh, Summit County. It looks pretty bad. If it wasn't for that substitution, it would be at about 160,000 acre feet or about 20 feet below where it is today. So there were some advantages uh, to this from a, from a recreation standpoint. Uh, but I learned in here that one of the that Jack Ross had a plan to uh, to to get around that proposal that we had, where they would come in and help us with Wolford and and agree to formal substitution agreements. That, that he had a he had a, a way to get around that. Unfortunately, it didn't work. <laughs> right. um, another question I think uh, related to Green Mountain uh, on that, and like some speculation from George is. I go back to 1955, and, and it's true, what happened there was that Judge Luby had said, you got a 1946 right, Denver, it's going to be junior to Green Mountain. Uh, the court had not yet formalized Green Mountain's uh, appropriation date, but the project had been built and had been operating, you know, and so it was obviously going to be before 1946, whether it was 35 or 33 were, were just a detail. And at that time, uh, the folks, there was a lot of political pressure, it appears to me, on the West Slope uh, to accommodate Denver, to allow them to what I call intercept the power water, uh, to, to use the water as long as the, we were guaranteed one fill of Green Mountain, they could use the power water. And, and I have to say that has led to confusion, complications. I'm looking at a few folks here that have been involved in the Green Mountain admin discussions. In many ways, those were much more difficult to negotiate than the Colorado River Cooperative Agreement. Uh, but do you, what was some of the pressure at the time? Why did the West Slope agree to this Blue River Decree compromise that allowed Denver to intercept the power water and effectively build Dillon with, with the, without with minimal interference from Green Mountain Reservoir. So what was the political attitude at the time? Why was the West Slope swept into that 55 compromise after they'd won in court? Well, I, I think uh, that, I mean, I, I can't look at that history without feeling like the, uh, <laughs> there's really, it's really a good guy, bad guy situation. The, the West Slope was a minority in a democracy. The Front Range was a very powerful, uh, growing metropolis. And uh, my, my feeling is that uh, the West Slope was trying to get the best deal it could without uh, uh, making the big guy so mad that uh, uh, it, it didn't work, really, because uh, the big guy was just mad. Uh, <laughs> and, that's all there was to it, and uh, I, I think that uh, they knew there was have to be a little bending on the Blue River 
to uh, get a consent decree through, and that was uh, something they could, uh, could, could bend on without it being too huge a loss. They ended up back in court two or three times trying to uh, right. uh, <laughs> essentially defend what had already been won. And we never won anything more in the court cases. Uh, we just managed to, Keep the courts got. basically said, uh, we've already decided this. And uh, usually they just send them upstairs to an empty room and uh, tell them to uh, figure it out and come back when you've got a, an agreement. and. Uh, but I, it's hard to uh, say that Denver was behaving like anything other than an arrogant bully a lot of the time in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. I, I just don't see how you can see it as anything other than that. Jim, do we want to ask it? Yeah. questions or something from the audience? Sure. Uh, on that note, it should be mentioned that we are good friends most of the time with Denver now. <laughs> oh, yeah. We are yeah, in an era changed. of cooperation. But um, we, should, we didn't mention this right off. The book is called Water Wranglers. It's free to those who are here. Otherwise, it costs twelve ninety five. <laughs> we just took our first shipment today. Fortunately, it was published in Grand Junction, printed in Grand Junction. And it will be available in selected bookstores and on Amazon and in time, short time, as an e-book. So um, you'll be able to read it in many different forms. But, um, and George will be available to, for those who didn't get a signed copy, he, he will be glad to do that uh, between now and our Ice Cream Social, which starts in 20 minutes. But meanwhile, would anybody have any questions? I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we'll, we'll pick up the survey sheets out front. But I, I, I too, want to thank George for this Herculean effort. Um, he did it in, what, two and a half years? And then, you know, about two years ago, he, or two, six months ago, he started reminding me that Northern's uh, history book uh, came out five years after their 50th. It kept getting delayed. and. I guess he wanted us to think that maybe delay would be a good idea on our part, but he, he, he soldiered through and um, it is a commendable effort. We thought it was gonna be about 200 and some pages, but it turned out to be a much bigger story. And I can tell you there's, even in 463 pages, there's a lot of details that still could be written. There's a. Do you consult with like, uh, I know Dan Tyler wrote a lot of uh, front range yeah, I uh, acknowledge openly in the acknowledgments that uh, I used uh, Tyler. I did. I used uh, several secondary sources because you know we were trying to do this in a year and a half. It ended up taking two years anyway, and uh, I just said there was no way to go back entirely to the original resources. Uh, on, on a lot of that. So the section about uh, the part of the book about Colorado Big Thompson, uh, I augmented it with a lot of information I found from the Frank Delaney papers and such like, but uh, I had to use uh, that. I used uh, Stephen Schulte's book about Wayne Aspinall, a good biography, uh, which almost is a, a history of the period as well as a biography. and. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, analysis papers that uh, had things that if I were doing this for a doctoral dissertation, I would have to have gone back to their original sources. There just wasn't time for that. So yeah, I used uh, Tyler's book and uh, 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 Schulte's book and stuff from Greg Hobbs. <laughs> Justice Hobbs was a wonderful help actually. <laughs> 